big academic event goes without his presence mm -hmm. secondly my personal experience with him is our paramita children hospital patients are getting very much benefited with his consultation with his guidance we are able to manage efficiently and most of the patients are extremely happy these are some of the good aspects of our uh, dr ramesh sinwasan thank you sir for sparing your precious time and joining us today and i thank our moderator dr navneel singh another senior pediatrician uh, director tanveer children's hospital the senior member all the time always advises our iaptcb thank you dr navneel singh for sparing your valuable time i request dr navneel singh to take over and conduct the proceedings over to dr navneel singh yeah. thank good evening everybody thank you dr sivirati garu and dr bhaskar for giving me an opportunity to uh, moderate this session inflammatory bowel disease in children is a very very common problem and most of the times we hello can i can you hear me yes yes am am i audible yes, yes. Yeah. inflammatory bowel disease in children is quite a common as dr bhaskar has just mentioned almost about 20 25% of the children which we miss out actually as pediatricians almost any pediatrician i don't think anybody has not seen any pain abdomen in their practice so every child comes once or twice for a pain abdomen but it is for us to decide what type of pain abdomen he has got proper taking history and then trying to evaluate what other things he has got so these things are becoming a very very common and most of the times if suppose we don't use our clinical acumen we might lose out on the diagnosis also so this particular presentation which we are going to have it by dr ramesh srinivasan is going to be very very interesting and he is going to elaborate on uh, how to diagnose how to take care of it and how to treat that this pain abdomen in some of the cases becomes a pain in the neck for the pediatricians so we have to be very alert we have to be very uh, cautious about taking the history and trying to see that what what is the, the treatment we are dealing with and many a times it can be a common problem but sometimes we might miss out on this very important diagnosis so now i would like to introduce dr ramesh srinivasan he is a consultant pediatric gastroenterologist from apollo hospital jubilee hills and adjunct professor of apollo hospital education and research foundation immediate previous appointment consultant gastroenterologist aldheri children's foundation nhs trust and senior lecturer institute of childhood university of liverpool uk his educational qualifications are he is a basically a pediatrician from chandigarh post graduate institute he has done his mrcp from edinburgh dca from london frcpch uc ct in pediatrics cssst in pediatric gastroenterology and hepatology board certification he had got training at chandigarh great diamond street, great ormond street st mary's london in liver kings college hospital london and st james leeds gastroenterology in liverpool and manchester national grade and he has got almost about 25 international publications to his credit he had won many awards silver medal in pediatrics in pgi gold medal for best outgoing student surgery ug first merit award in internal medicine now over to you dr ramesh srinivasan thank you dr yeah before dr ramesh starts request uh, all the participants uh, to please cooperate you will all be on mute once the first slide starts please raise your hand towards the end if you want to personally talk to the speaker through the session please type your comments share your experiences thoughts and uh, put up your queries in the zoom group chat box and we, the moderator will take up discussion afterwards we have uh, a session for about 45 to 50 minutes and i now hand it over to uh, Dr. Ramesh, Dr. Ramesh, you may proceed, please. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sri Krishna. Thank you, Dr. Navneel Singh, for a very kind introduction. Uh, and uh, I need to take this opportunity to congratulate IAPTCB for the excellent series of webinars they have organized over the last two weeks, keeping us academically stimulated during the lockdown. 
So my personal thanks to Dr. Sian Reddy, Dr. Baskar, Dr. Srinath, and uh, the whole IAPTCB team for making this happen. So this uh, gastroenterology is a subspeciality of pediatrics, and uh, it is actually very closely aligned to the broad speciality of pediatrics because growth, nutrition, and development are core elements of both these areas. And thereby, as pediatricians, we do see a lot of children with bowel problems, and some of them may turn out to have inflammatory bowel disease. The problem with inflammatory bowel disease is it is not good news for the family if the child is diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease. The problem is there is no medical cure for this condition. And only wishfully and prayfully, we want to wait and see that they have these very infrequent relapses and long remissions of disease-free periods. And that is what we do as medical gastroenterologists in trying to improve the quality of life of these children and their parents. So today, I'm going to talk about inflammatory bowel disease, and I'll be very simplistic in my viewpoint because these conditions are a little mismatch of each other, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and they have their own overlaps and differences. And sometimes it's a little tricky, but not too difficult to actually unravel what these two diseases could actually sort of manifest as in children. So what I would do, without much ado, I would start off with the first slide. So in inflammatory bowel disease, what we are looking at is a chronic relapsing inflammation of the intestine. Each word is particularly important that has got a deep meaning to it. It's idiopathic. We really do not understand how these diseases cause multifactorial, as we'll see. And it's chronic. It's not just a one time come and one time go. It's going to be there for a lifetime for the majority of uh, patients. Remitting and relapsing. So it's like a yo-yo. And life basically oscillates between these being well and being unwell. And sometimes it's refractory and requires escalation of treatment, both medical and sometimes surgical. So it's a little malady of sorts and not very happy. So, but keeping the classification simple, IBD, the different types are ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and we now have something in between where you're not clear, no one is clear, despite doing clinical, endoscopic, serological, pathological, radiological investigation, still you're not clear in around 10% of cases. Previously, we used to call this indeterminate colitis, but now we call this slightly different. We call this unclassified IBD or IBDU. Now this IBDU with time will fall into either one of the two categories, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. And in our experience at the UK Pediatric IBD Registry, which was maintained in Liverpool, luckily so, almost every 10% of these children, they get reclassified every yearly. And majority of them get classified as ulcerative colitis rather than Crohn's. And the last one I have put in italics is called VEOIBD. This is a new term, a new term even to the gastroenterologist. We have now seen IBD in children. Dr. Baskar said one fourth of all IBD is classified or diagnosed in childhood. Now, we tend to see IBD even among the little ones, let's say, in children as young as one year, two years, six years. So any IBD which has been diagnosed in children less than six years of age is classified into a new category called very early onset IBD. And this seems to have some immunological kind of causes, some monogenetic causes, which basically put them into a special category where regular kind of medications may not work. Some of them may require immunological treatments and some even require bone marrow transplantation to get them better. So I will do three interesting cases just to start the whole uh, aspect of IBD. Now, first one was an eight-year-old boy who presented to us with bleeding per rectum for a month. There was no family history. He had completed two courses of antibiotics. Majority of times, bleeding per rectum in our practice comes from dysentric illnesses, maybe amoebiasis, salmonella, shigella, ersenia, E. coli, etc. So it's not wrong for people to have courses of antibiotics, and majority of cases they actually resolve with antibiotic treatment. It's important to note that 
case of IBD may also present with an infectious diarrhea in the beginning. And it basically uncovers the tendency for inflammatory bowel disease in a small percentage of them. It's very important not to overemphasize that everything which presents with a bloody diarrhea is IBD. Majority of them are infectious colitis. And basically, infectious colitis, once treated, will not cause a problem which will be chronic and, and remitting and relapsing and giving trouble. Now, he also had pallor. He was pale, maybe because of the blood loss, but he had a three centimeter splenic edge, which was actually not very common. And his hemoglobin is only 5.4. White cell count was also low at 3,600. Platelet count was also low at 70,000. So something else fishy, apart from just the bleeding from the rectum. His liver numbers were also slightly abnormal with transaminases of 87 and 112. And his bilirubin, possibly upper limit of normal at 1.2 milligrams per deciliter. So long story short, this boy went on to have a colonoscopy which showed that his colon was inflamed right from the rectum till the cecum. So it was a pancolitis. Pancolitis means the whole colon is involved. And this kind of colon, we describe it as superficial inflammation and presence of friability and also contact bleeding. When the scope touches the edges of the intestine, it bleeds and it looks like a sandpaper colon. Compare it to the normal colon, which is basically shown on the right side, the salmon pink, pink, easy to see um, vascular um, uh, pattern. And uh, on biopsies, the normal one on the right side shows crypts, which have got a little bit of mucus in it. Mucus is actually protective. And while you look on the left, you actually see that these crypts are filled with what is called pus. It's basically called cryptapsis. There is also some areas of crypt branching. Clinical diagnosis, possible inflammatory bowel disease, pathological diagnosis, ulcerative colitis. So this boy had ulcerative colitis. Okay, from the PR bleeding point of view, but what about the splenic edge, about the liver function, abnormalities? What about the low platelets and white cell count? Because that needs explanation as well. So this boy went on to have an MRCP scan, which showed lots of short biliary strictures with the dilatations and stricturing. And that was suggestive of sclerosing cholangitis, which was aptly proven on a liver biopsy. And his bicytopenia was ascribed to hypersplenism, which also is a part of sclerosing cholangitis. So this boy had ulcerative colitis with an extra intestinal manifestation of the sclerosing cholangitis, what he had. And this boy went on to have a liver transplant for sclerosing cholangitis, repeated episodes of cholangitis with severe right upper quadrant abdominal pain, poor quality of life. And he actually sort of is doing now very well and is in Canada. Now, next case, this case is different. Now, this one is a 10 year old boy, three month history of weight loss and fever. He did not have any bleeding per abdomen rectum and weight loss was the main and important feature. He had fever and central abdominal pain. He could not go to school because he could not concentrate on his lessons. In fact, he was actually a very clever and studious kid. And uh, there is basically no family history again. And this was strange to them because never have they seen this boy so unwell. And on examination, he had swollen lips and anal tags. And I think I've given you a clue that this could be something like an inflammatory bowel disease. And uh, his CRP was elevated at 120, ESR elevated at 85, and he also had a fecal calprotectin, which is a test we have been doing for the last few years, which tells us about inflammation in the intestine. Simple rule, fecal calprotectin less than 100, take it as normal, 100 to 200, doubt about inflammatory bowel disease, more than 300, very likely inflammatory bowel disease. So immediately, the next step, basically looking at the growth charts here, he was falling off the centile lines, both in terms of weight and height. Weight tends to get affected first, height later. And his mouth basically showed ulceration after the ulcers. His lips were all chapped and his tongue was actually fissured. And his uh, anal region basically showed a hairy anal fissure. And on upper GI endoscopy, on the far right upper, you actually see esophagus also showed after ulcers and stomach showed inflammation, surprisingly. And his colon was actually very, very inflamed. And what you can see is a lot of mucopus sitting on a very long longitudinal serpiginous ulcer, as they call it. And the whole mucosa is actually solid. Now, he went on to have barium studies, which showed a long stricture, which you actually can see in the x-ray down below. And uh, the resection specimen showed granulomas. Important thing is, you see granulomas in the intestine, you stamp a diagnosis of Crohn's disease. Important thing, there should be a non-caseating granuloma because then you have a problem if you have caseation, which will be tuberculosis. So this boy had Crohn's disease, showed non-caseating granuloma, and that is the diagnosis here. 
Now, the third case, third illustrative case, this is the last case I'm going to discuss, was a very tiny one, a 10-month-old baby born at term, first cousin parents, so they were related. And he had loose stool with blood and mucus from five months onwards, and he had a very sore bottom with lots of perianal disease and tags. And his weight at 10 months was 3.62 kilos, which was abysmal. And uh, he had multiple perianal skin tags, and was very, very unwell. He came to us after lots of investigations from um, uh, pediatricians, rheumatologists, immunologists, etc. And they've done lots and lots of um, tests on him. And he basically had a whole immune workup done. And uh, they diagnosed him to have possible CMV colitis because his CMV IgM was positive. He had CMV 500 copies on PCR. He received three-week course of gancyclovir. He had multiple courses of Cipro, Met, and Fluconazole with no clinical improvement. Then... Well, after he came to us, we did look at all that. The immunological thought was very, very important and very good here. And what I could see here was a lot of ulcers all over the colon. And these ulcers are not the common kinds what we see. They were large, flask-like ulcers with deep edges. And uh, they basically were re um, sort of all over the colon in this particular case. The biopsies basically showed one of these ulcers with a lot of cryptabscesses stamping the diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease. This boy was only 10 months old and he had such severe inflammatory bowel disease. This gets classified as very early onset IBD, BEO IBD. In three, uh, four years, the classifications have changed. Previously, we used to call this condition intractable ulcerating enterocolitis of infancy, but now we call it with a different name, that is VEO IBD. And this boy went on to have an IL-10 mutation, a signaling pathway defect, and uh, luckily so far he's doing well just on azathioprine, a brief course of infliximab, and he's doing well. So, uh, just a second. Hello. Overlap. Oh dear, you're able to see too many. Should I just read? Okay. Yeah, we'll... Dr. Amish. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Amish, if you could exit the slide and yeah. end the presentation and start okay, it yes, again. So we'll probably, do that. probably it's just the transition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it seems better this way. Now is it okay? Now it's perfect. Please go ahead. Okay, fine. Right. Done. So this boy um, went on to have steroids, as a theoprin, and uh, required a brief duration on infliximab, but so far doing well. The DEO IBD patients, if they actually sort of are poorly, many times they may be subject to a hemopoietic stem cell transplantation. So from here, we then go to differential diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease. All of us is of, um, uh, in pediatric practice, we do children with loose motion, and we do see children with blood per rectum. And whenever blood per rectum is seen in the small ones, we think about intersusception, we think about um, infective colitis, we are thinking about hemolytic uremic syndrome, we are basically thinking about allergic enterocolitis, especially in the little babies who are cow milk fed, or even those who are breastfed where mothers are taking dairy products. Important differential is IBD can also present like that, but allergic enterocolitis, especially the likes of common protein intolerance, what we see are called allergic octocolitis. No one does scopes in them, but in case if someone did a scope on a little baby like that, the rectum would be the most commonly involved. Allergic enterocolitis can also happen in older children, especially who have definite allergies to different kinds of food components. So that's an important differential and possibly that's very common in our practice. The next one, I've put it angiodysplasia, AV malformations, bleeding vessels in the intestine is number three diagnosis. Sometimes you have lesions which actually bleed. Sometimes you have ectopic varices which can bleed. Sometimes you can have vessels in abnormal locations which can bleed very close to a Meckel's diverticulum because of ulceration of the yeah, gastric mucosa and the Meckel's diverticulum. Sometimes bleeds happen in duplication cysts, like this particular case, which me and one of our local pediatric surgeons did an intraoperative endoscopy. Vasculitis of different kinds can present with bleeds. Typically, is a case of henox online purpura. Sometimes with henox online purpura, they can have a bleeding PR. Sometimes, to confuse us, a few days before the skin rash starts, and everyone is confused as to where this bleed has actually come from. Most of the times, we know that the rash comes first, and all the other manifestations come later. So, henox online purpura is also a very important differential. What we need to keep in mind. The next one is ischemic colitis. So shocked children, 
children who have undergone bypass cardiac surgery the gut takes the hit in whenever the body goes into a state of shock splanchanic vasoconstriction happens almost immediately from dr prasad's presentation yesterday we knew that the body takes a diving response and the blood circulation to the brain the heart and the kidneys is maintained and who takes a hit the gut the gut takes a hit the liver also takes a hit so ischemic colitis especially happens in the watershed area between the superior mesenteric and the inferior mesenteric arteries that can also present with gi bleeds now meckels is a very important differential what we need to keep in mind whenever there is a blood peripheral meckels diverticulum as surgeons would say La the last two diagnoses are purely gastroenterological solitary rectal ulcer syndrome in children who have a dyssynergic defecation so they may have blood per rectum with mucus and uh, last of all polyp disease polyp disease is also very very common juvenile polyps usually bleed a lot usually seen in children between the age of 3 to 7 but there are also some very well defined polyposis syndromes which can also present in pr group so differential diagnosis of ibd can include conditions where there is weight loss where there is abdominal pain where there is diarrhea where there is bleeding per rectum and thereby the differential of ibd is actually the whole gamut of pediatrics So pediatric IBD, like Dr. Basker said, 25% cases start in childhood. Mean age of diagnosis around 10 years. More males are affected than females. In India, there have been few case studies on pediatric IBD. It still has to be defined a lot, and uh, we have four particular series presented in India. The first study came from Chandigarh, the descriptive study, where 5% of all children with colitic symptoms had ulcerative colitis. So, what is colitic symptom? Abdominal pain before motion and after motion, tenesmus, feeling of incomplete defecation, blood in the stool, or mucus in the stool. Chennai, Malathi, Satyasekaran, and Bhaskar Raju's study: only ten cases of Crohn's was written up. Four of them had fistulae. Eight of them had a colonic Crohn's rather than an ileocecal Crohn's. Study from CMC Vellore: they basically showed a paper. Where there were 23 children with Crohn's disease, 11 with ulcerative colitis. Important to remember this number that Crohn's disease cases are double in frequency compared to ulcerative colitis in children. A lot of them in India were malnourished who had this particular problem. And a series from Mumbai, which was 2018, basically showed that they had sort of around 70% pan colitis and ulcerative colitis. I'll summarize their main findings in the next slide. So pediatric IBD in India. Mostly in ulcerative colitis, there is pan colitis. What is pan colitis? The whole colon is involved. In contrast to proctor colitis, where the rectum is involved, ulcerative colitis always starts at the fag end. The rectum is the most involved area in ulcerative colitis, and the disease may spread retrograde to the colon up to the cecum. And in hello, sir. Dr. Ramesh, again the okay, slides again. are over. I'll, I'll do that again. I'll do that again. Sir. Yes. Or you, you could try just using the regular screen. Yeah. Yeah. Is it okay now? It's better now. This yeah, is better. better now. Yes. Okay. So, um, and uh, Crohn's disease in Indian children is more common than ulcerative colitis, but the incidence of severe stricturing and fistulating Crohn's disease is the same as adults. Crohn's disease. affects all layers of the intestine but ulcerative colitis is only a superficial disease and crohn's disease can affect anywhere from the mouth to the anus in illustrative case 2 we had a boy who had problems in his mouth and he has broad problems at the fag end at the bottom with the perianal tags and it affects areas in between skipping areas in between as well ulcerative colitis however tends to be a continuous disease while crohn's disease tends to have lots of gaps in the way it actually affects us So, inflammatory bowel disease seems to be an interplay of a lot of different things. There is not one particular thing we say that this is causative etiologically, and so there are lots of things which basically have to be put into this mishmash of things. They say genetics are very important. Now, if you basically look at twin studies, the monozygotic twins, the concordance rate for inflammatory bowel disease is maximum thirty to forty percent. The rest sixty percent. it happens because of environmental influence family clustering is also seen in some cases up to 20% in the family there may be more people who have inflammatory bowel disease they may have people with crohn's or ulcerative colitis environmental triggers 
it seems to be that the microbiota of the intestine are very, very important in the causation of inflammation of bowel disease. The kind of food we eat, food antigens, the bacteria which live in our intestines, our genetic makeup, along with most importantly, an inappropriate adaption of your immune system. So there are four pieces of the jigsaw here, which basically operate why some people get inflammatory bowel disease while some others do not. Inflammatory bowel disease is increasing in India. Is it because of the westernized diet, what we eat, which is high in sugar and fat? Or because of other environmental triggers, which we do not recognize, is important. The one statement which sums up everything is chronic inappropriate activation of the adaptive immune system against common cell bacteria. So these bacteria are going to be very, very important in the way in which our immune system works with them. This is a particular study from Asian Institute of Gastroenterology, which was done on our Indian children. And the familial IBD cases were noted in around 4% uh, in our population compared to around 20% in the Western countries. Now, this is a very complicated slide, and I didn't want to seem clever by actually wanting to show this. But actually, I'll take a little piece of this and show. Now, what happens is, normally, the intraluminal pathogens, a small number of them are allowed to enter the lamina propria. And this is possibly called what is antigenic sampling. And uh, what happens is this immune system normally says, okay, boss, you're all commensals, you stay there, we are happy, you're happy, and we'll do what is called a tolerance signaling. So we are immune tolerant to you, you stay where you are, we know you're commensals, we know that you're possibly useful to us, and you stay there. But some of them may be rogue elements like intraluminal pathogens also, to which an appropriate immune response will be mounted. However, if you actually have the T cell receptors which basically called toll -like, um, uh, toll like receptors, if they signal abnormally, then they may actually stimulate the nuclear uh, coding factors called the um, nuclear factor kappa beta and produce lots and lots of cytokines. Similarly, chronic inflammation may happen because of a particular protein called NOT2, which gets chronically stimulated. And uh, there's also defective autophagy, which also stimulates chronic inflammation. Importantly, the defective immune system, the immune system, which gets overactively reacting to intraluminal pathogens and mounts response in a cascadic fashion, overwhelmingly. So that basically is known to cause inflammatory bowel disease. There are so many different variants of this and almost 200 different genes have been described which can be causative of inflammatory bowel disease. A lot of cytokines are increased in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Two most important ones among them are tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin 1. Also in UC, you have other cytokines also, but most of our treatments are also targeted at the chief rogue cytokine, which is TNF-alpha, which seems to be the most important um, causative of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And going back to genes and genetics, now there's a mind-boggling amount of research on IBD genetics. The first important gene to be diagnosed was NOT2, or the IBD5 gene. And furthermore, there are several more genes which are described. NOT2 is the most important gene for Crohn's disease, in some populations, like in France, up to 30% of the Crohn's disease patients may have a NOT2 gene mutation. IL-23 gene mutations have been known to see in some patients with ulcerative colitis, while IL-10 gene mutations are seen in a significant number of children with very early onset IPD. But the vast majority may not have a clear-cut genetic basis, or we possibly do not know at this point in time. But the important thing is, IBD is a polygenetic condition, multifactorial condition, where all the pieces of the jigsaw need to go together with an abnormal immune response to the gut antigens and the food antigens in a genetically susceptible individual. Also, dysbiosis seems to play a role. You have abnormal bacteria in the intestine, it may cause. In IBD patients, reduced Clostridium species was seen. Increased adherent invasive E. coli was seen. Important thing is, in some cases of ulcerative colitis, in mild to moderate UC, remission has been achieved by fecal microbial transplant, which I think is going to become more and more useful in the time to come. We are still very early with this modality of a not so glamorous treatment of fecal microbial transplant. So diagnosis of IBD, how do we do it? Clinical, first thing is clinical, we suspect it. 
Once you suspect it, you can do a battery of tests to try and confirm your suspicion. And that could be uh, doing a fecal examination, excluding an infectious colitis, excluding amoebiasis, excluding giardiasis, and uh, basically doing that fecal calprotectin, which is now considered to be a very useful thing. Fecal calprotectin elevations are considered to be more significant than ESR and CRP elevations. And they are a useful thing. It's available uh, in Hyderabad. We can get it. Serological testing. There are a few kinds of serological tests for P. anchor and uh, another um, autoantibody called ASCA, anti-saccharomyces cerevisiae antibodies. P. anchor is seen to be in almost 70% of UC patients positive, while ASCA is positive in around 70% of Crohn's patients. Important to remember, both these antibodies can be present in both groups, but P. anchor is more likely to be seen in UC and ASCA in Crohn's disease. If you do not have access to these tests, we don't need to worry about them. Most important thing, is to give the job to the gastroenterologist to do an upper GI endoscopy and an ileocolonoscopy. It's not just a colonoscopy, it's an ileocolonoscopy. We want to enter that terminal part of the small intestine to actually have a look at it because the ileum is a very important site which is affected in Crohn's disease. Also, you may have what is called backwash ileitis in ulcerative colitis, which we can also pick up. Now, endoscopy may show changes in the upper GI tract as well as in the colon which may actually be suggestive. And the most important thing is to pick up biopsies from it and give it to the pathologist so that we try and see what we have, crypt abscesses, crypt branching, granulomas, what kind of inflammation we have. If you find a granuloma, non-casating granuloma, that basically makes you very clear about a diagnosis of Crohn's. But unfortunately, only in around 50% of cases, you may find a granuloma. You may not find a granuloma at all in the majority of them. So we have to put different pieces of the jigsaw together to make up a diagnosis. So now, important. Dr. Ramesh, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we're still having that overlapping yeah, of slides. Yeah, yeah, can just yeah. exit the slideshow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can just proceed like this. Yeah. You tell me whenever and I'll yeah, do that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, important thing is now we say Crohn's disease, we say ulcerative colitis. We have had a look at the upper endoscopy. So, you have seen the food pipe, stomach, and the beginning of the duodenum up to the C of the duodenum. And in the ileocolonoscopy, you have just put your nose into the fag end of the ileum. But there is a whole small intestine from the D3, D4 till the terminal ileum, which you have not seen. Crohn's disease does not spare any region. It can affect from the mouth to the anus and it can show skip areas. Sometimes you have a condition where only the small bubble will be affected and nothing else will be affected. And that is the most challenging thing called mid-gut Crohn's. So how do we find it out? So we should have a different kind of modality. So we have to become Sherlock Holmes now to find out what's happening in the small intestine. And the way we do it earlier, we used to do a barium meal and follow through. But now the barium meal and follow through involves fluoroscopy, lots of radiation. And the barium meal and follow through defines what is happening inside the intestine or lumen. Extra luminal disease is not very well defined with barium. And unfortunately, the radiation amount is also very high. So MR enterography is now come to stay as the top mid-gut investigation in Crohn's disease. No radiation, good definition, and even the intraluminal definition is just as good as the barium. So adult gastroenterologists tend to do what is called enteroclysis, where they put contrast agents into the small intestine by inserting a nasogeotubule tube. It is very difficult in children. They don't tolerate it. And obviously, we do most of our MRs under general anesthesia, and we do not want to do it with a belly full of fluid. So for us, MR enterography is what we do. And the last of all, I've put wireless capsule endoscopy with a star on it. Wireless capsule endoscopy is where you can actually swallow a capsule, and it basically sends images to a recorder, um, which is um, strapped onto the child's waist. And what happens is you can actually sort of at leisure scan all the pictures and try to make a decision for yourself whether midgut is affected by, by, um, by Crohn's disease. Now, the issue is wireless capsule endoscopy cannot be successfully performed in children less than the uh, a, a weight of 12 kilos. And if children have stricturing disease, the capsule can get struck and capsule retention can be a problem which may require surgical exploration. So wireless capsule endoscopy has got its role, but then you need to select your patients very clearly. So approach always ileocolonoscopy with upper G endoscopy. 
issue is many times some uh, parents as well as some professionals also say why do you want to do the upper endoscopy he is only having rectal bleeding do just the colonoscopy now important even versa some adult doctors would only do a sigmoidoscopy sigmoidoscopy will miss a whole lot of disease in the rest of the colon and if you do an upper gi endoscopy there is a 30% pick up rate for crohn's disease crohn's affects anywhere in the gi tract and 30% of diagnosis may actually come from an upper gi endoscopy so the most important caveat here is not to perform and not to miss on performing an upper gi endoscopy upper gi endoscopy should be performed in all children with suspected inflammatory bowel disease so dr ramesh it's again overlapping you can just yes. exit the slide show and just show the slides it'll be easier probably resolution is the issue okay yeah go okay. to the next yeah this is fine this is fine see this is a little complicated diagram i don't want to make things complicated because i'm a simple gastroenterologist so strong suspicion of ibd do the fecal testing do the blood testing suspicion subject to upper gi endoscopy and ileo colonoscopy if you think clear cut ulcerative colitis you don't need to do any further testing if you don't think it's ulcerative colitis you're thinking of crohn's don't miss mid gut crohn's so get an mr enterography of the abdomen If you don't have access to MR, you can do old-style barium wave and follow it. If the diagnosis is clear through all this, and you have actually sort of um, distribution of the disease is clear, then you can diagnose them as Crohn's or ulcerative colitis and start treatment. But sometimes you will still have some IBD unclassified, only which will be unraveled in the time to come. Wireless capsule endoscopy has got its role in the right kind of children. So, ileal colonoscopy, making the diagnosis clear, if not mid-gut imaging. then wireless capsule endoscopy if necessary only to try and keep things very simple so you see as you can see it affects the uh, large bubble majority of times it affects Do the, dr the, ramesh again it's overlapping wait i will do this one yeah. now this is okay it's good it's i will good. do like this huh? with the yeah, side that's better huh? so in ulcerative colitis it can start in the rectum so that is called proctocolitis it can involve the whole of the intestine then it becomes pancolitis in children majority of times they present with pancolitis rather than proctocolitis yeah and uh, there is a scoring system for the severity of um, disease and you have some pediatric scoring systems as well the mayo score for endoscopic severity is used we're looking at how bad the mucosa is affected it's classified as 0 1 2 and 3 most of these are used in both clinical as well as academic circles to express how bad the disease is to the next person so in ulcerative colitis superficial inflammation cryptitis cryptabscesses now this is an important thing called pediatric ulcerative colitis activity index this is a very useful clinical index to gauge how severe your patient with ulcerative colitis is and even actually in treatment planning and even in changing treatment plans you want to use this ulcerative colitis activity index less than 10 which means remission and 10 to 34 is mild disease 35 to 64 is moderate disease and more than 65 severe disease the most important use of this is when you want to jump treatments from one level to another level where you want to go for a more toxic or a more invasive treatment you want to check the ulcerative colitis activity index to give some objectivity to your assessment so that is important now having said all and explained all the fundamental rules we also have what is called atypical ulcerative colitis ulcerative colitis we said the ground rules is it always involves the rectum and from the rectum it gets uh, extended up proximally in 5% there may be a rectal sparing so that's called atypical this is for this is a pearl it's a nugget it's for actually the more discerning ones now there can also be a cecal patch around the appendix and in ulcerative colitis we have always been taught in medical school upper gi involvement think crohn's don't think ulcerative colitis which is not particularly true so where we get into the nitty gritty of things small gastric ulcers can be seen in 4 to 8% of ulcerative colitis also so ulcerative colitis and crohn's with their differences with their similarities and with their overlaps there are a malady of different things but for the people like me who have been doing this job at the end of the day they fall into some clearly defined kind of groups instead of actually quoting different guidelines and uh, um, citing things i would rather say most of my um, talk is based on guidelines from the echo and the echo which is european crohn's and colitis organization and espagan european society of pediatric gastroenterology hepatology nutrition now the guidelines are brilliantly done 
So they are evidence-based and consensus-driven. And most people on this planet tend to follow these guidelines. So in treatment-wise for ulcerative colitis, we start off with steroids to induce remission. So the words are inducing remission and maintaining remission. So ASA is aminosalicylates. They are just like salicylic acid molecules which locally work to reduce inflammation. So once you have a first or a second relapse, you may want to start a steroid sparing agent like azathioprine or 6 mercaptoprine Things may actually work out very well at this stage for most people with ulcerative colitis. Majority of them may not require the, the top tiers of the pyramid. But sometimes things not working well, difficult disease, one may want to try cyclosporin or tacrolimus. Cyclosporin is a kind of difficult um, medicine with its side effects and nephrotoxicity and uh, the hirsutism and the looks and things like that. Tacrolimus, some people tend to use. But more and more, now people are using biologicals for the refractory ulcerative colitis with the use of infliximab. Important to note, infliximab was actually um, used more for Crohn's disease. It's still being used for Crohn's disease, but also finding its application in ulcerative to colitis as well. Important to remember, DNF alpha is the culprit in ulcerative colitis also, and the biologics basically target DNF alpha here. And in a small percentage of patients, you may want to treat them with surgery. Now, an important caveat here is ulcerative colitis has got a cure, while Crohn's disease doesn't have a cure. And the ultimate cure for ulcerative colitis is a colectomy surgery. The most important thing is we as medical gastroenterologists want to not subject our children to colectomy or even adults for that matter. That's our main job. Preventing colectomy is the objective of medical treatment. So the kind of surgeries they do are a proctocolectomy and ileostomy in a very severe disease or those presenting with a toxic megacolon or if you actually see that there's a dysplastic change because ulcerative colitis is known to be a precursor for colorectal cancer. So colorectal cancer, the incidence of colorectal cancer is 0.5 to 1% per year. So ulcerative colitis, once someone has had a diagnosis for 10 years, they have a cancer risk and they need to be scoped regularly, at least every two yearly after they've reached 10 years of diagnosis. So surgeries for ulcerative colitis could include uh, proctocolectomy and ileostomy. And later you may want to actually create a pouch, which basically sort of is a portion of the terminal ileum, which is sewed together to the rectum. And you may basically sort of have continence at the same time, some amount of capacity to hold feces before you have to go for those um, uh, uh, um, uh, defecation. Probiotics also seem to have some effect in ulcerative colitis only, not in Crohn's, especially VSL3 and uh, Escherichia coli in 1917. But important to remember, probiotics and all these things tend to work for mild to moderate disease, but when you have a severe flaring disease, nothing works as good as steroids. Now, we have to now uh, go to Crohn's. Now, the spectrum of IBD, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's, they are here to stay. They have their overlaps with indeterminate colitis, and uh, ulcerative colitis is continuous, while Crohn's disease is patchy. Crohn's affects mouth awareness, a full thickness involvement, fistulae, abscesses, strictures um, are known. Extraintestinal manifestations are seen both in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So, this is uh, um, Bernard Crohn, American gastroenterologist from Mount Sinai in New York. And it all started off after 1932, where they described a series of patients who had terminal ileitis. So initial name for Crohn was terminal ileitis. It affects any part of the GIT, variable presentation, and systemic symptoms are very important, like fever, lack of energy, abdominal pain, sometimes abdominal mass also. Important to note, Crohn's disease basically affects all the layers, mucosa, submucosa, muscular layer, and serosa, while ulcerative colitis is typically a mucosal disease. Pediatric Crohn's, more in males than females. And in pediatric Crohn's, extensive involvement or a whole colonic involvement is more common than ileocecal uh, disease, which is seen more in adults. Nearly half of them have gastroduodenal disease or jejunal disease. Important in pediatric Crohn's is the younger you get diagnosed, the more severe it gets. And it basically gets very windy towards the end. And the progression of disease is rapid. So pediatric diagnosis of Crohn's is bad news. Extraintestinal manifestations, they may even precede Crohn's disease. Sometimes this small joint arthritis, they may even come before a diagnosis of Crohn's is made, as it happened many times in our experience. Extraintestinal manifestations can happen both with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, uveitis, episcleritis, iritis. Now, important thing for us is some skin problems, erythema nodosum, pyoderma gangrenosum. Now, I showed in case one, boy with ulcerative colitis had sclerosing cholangitis. 
So sclerogen cholangitis happens more with ulcerative colitis than Crohn's, but can happen in both the conditions. Now, importantly, the most common extraintestinal manifestation we can see is arthritis, small joint arthritis, like the peripheral joint arthritis, sometimes arthritis of the knees and ankles. Now, these kind of small joint arthritis will respond whenever you treat the intestine and will mirror what is happening in the GI tract. But the arthritis involving the spine, the spondyloarthritis, the sacroiliitis, and the ankylosing spondylitis seen in a B2, uh, B27 positive patient, you see they have got nothing to do with what's happening in the GIT or what remedies you're giving. They tend to continue differently to what's happening in the gut. And especially when you have a child with severe extraintestinal manifestations of IBD, including very severe perianal disease, one should choose biologics as the first treatment and hit them really hard and set it up. Important thing, pediatrics, gastroenterology, growth. Growth is very important for us. So growth failure because of increased nutritional needs, suboptimal intake, anorexic, not wanting to eat, a lot of cytokines in the body, difficult. Um, mucosal surface inflamed, not able to absorb the goodness of food, bad. Corticosteroids, reducing your growth, bad. So basically it's several whammy here. So children with IBD are basically get a raw deal and a loss and they have to be treated quickly to set them on track. So growth failure is important in pediatric IBD and as pediatrician, the guardians of childhood like what I'm seeing was told yesterday, we need to work on growth and many of them may actually require supplements of food, sometimes even nasogastric feed or gastrostomy feed to set their growth right. Now, one important question which always pops up is Crohn's disease versus uh, tuberculosis. Crohn's disease and tuberculosis, India, lots of tuberculosis cases, ileocecal TB can present just like Crohn's disease. To make um, our job easy, this is a paper um, from one of the big, big names in uh, pediatric gastroenterology, Dr. Yacha and his team from SGPGI. And uh, in their particular study, what they have proposed is blood in the stool, left-sided involvement, longitudinal ulcers, on colonoscopy, extra intestinal manifestations go more in favor of growth. However, if you have a subacute intestinal obstruction, ascites, ileocecal localization, it favors TB. Importantly, the ileal biopsy is very, very necessary here. And that has to be subjected to the gene expert test, AFB staining, culture, prove that it is Crohn's disease or not. If you find caseating granuloma, diagnosis clear, TB non-caseating granuloma with no other features, Crohn's disease, gene expert negative Crohn's disease. And then in their particular study, AFP detection rate was 40%. To make things a little more complicated and hazy, you also have a pediatric Crohn's disease activity index, just like the ulcerative colitis activity index to help you with treatment planning and follow. I won't go into details. It's actually both a laboratory as well as a clinical kind of index. Endoscopic evaluation, important takeaway, upper and lower GI endoscopy, full ileo colonoscopy and upper GI endoscopy is needed. Treatment of Crohn's also has a pyramid like ulcerative colitis, but here the bottommost rung of the pyramid is different. Here we tend to use a not so invasive, a not so difficult treatment like enteral feed treatment or steroids. And if they don't work, then we actually sort of go on to add immunomodulators, similarly azotioprine, 6 mercaptopurine. And then the third rung of the ladder is using methotrexate in Crohn's disease, where you have a difficult to control disease. Biologicals have a very big role in the treatment of the refractory Crohn's patients and surgery, especially localized areas, bits which are diseased. Crohn's, important not to actually do very extensive surgery because we need to have a lifetime with the same gut. So Crohn's disease treatment, induced remission, maintained remission, regular follow-ups, and uh, immunosuppression biological, surgical intervention as minimalistic only when needed. Exclusive enteral nutrition to induce remission in Crohn's. A lot of studies have been conducted from 1975. Three meta-analysis. The first choice for induction is exclusive enteral nutrition. It sounds very fancy, but it's difficult to do. For six to eight weeks, you have to give only particular kinds of a milk formula, either a polymeric formula or an elementary formula as the only food. And this has got effect just as good as steroids in inducing remission, but it needs motivation and perseverance. And sometimes we have actually sort of put in nasogastric tubes or gastrostomies to actually feed children. It works very well and it avoids the side effects of steroids. Next step, if you can't do um, exclusive enteral nutrition, use steroids. Steroids reduce IL-1 production, reduce antigen presentation, reduce the number of lymphocytes. Steroids basically uh, can help that way. If it's someone is very acutely unwell, IV methylprednisolone. If they're okay, office practice, oral prednisolone. 
Now, there's also this steroid called budesonide, which has got a very good high first pass effect in the liver and only works very well for right-sided Crohn's disease. And it does not have all the side effects of steroids. And sometimes people have used budesonide orally, nine milligrams a day, as a long-term treatment for Crohn's disease. Hydrocortisone is old style, has got a lot of mineralocorticoid action as well at fluid retention, so it's not particularly used. For acutely unwell patients, methylprednisolone, for the well patients to um, scale down, we go on to oral prednisolone. But you cannot keep children on steroid forever, so we have to actually sort of uh, basically put them on a steroid sparing agent. And among these, there are so many different medicines what we want to use. Aminosalicylates are very good for ulcerative colitis, do not have too much of effect on Crohn's disease. And azathioprine as a immunomodulator, basically sort of, uh, uh, it basically gets converted to 6 mercaptopurine in the body and uh, it basically um, um, works through re reduction DNA production of the lymphocytes. Azathioprine has got its own side effects. It takes 8 to 14 weeks to start working and better to start it at full dose. Also, we normally check for an enzyme level called TPMT, which metabolizes 6 mercaptopurine in the body. If you have lower levels or high levels, there is a problem. And if you have low levels, you may have increased myelotoxicity, bone marrow toxicity with azothioprine. Anyone on azothioprine should be monitored for pancreatitis, hepatitis, and bone marrow suppression. But azothioprine is a good medicine. It tends to keep children steroid-free for long periods of time. And the one-year steroid-free remission period is around 60 to 90 percent. But there is a problem with all immunosuppressants. We need to be careful that children do not get live vaccines and children basically are not exposed to illnesses like chickenpox or any uh, particular pandemic situation like this. And uh, um, we normally vaccinate before starting on these medications. There's a small increased lymphoma risk with azathioprine use, especially in those children who also need biologicals for managing their Crohn's disease. How long to give azathioprine? We do not know. This is a particular meta-analysis I did um, when I was actually sort of in the UK. And uh, till 18 months, we have clear guidance. And beyond that, we really do not know indefinitely how long you can use azathioprine. Majority of times, we normally take around, around four years of azathioprine treatment. If things are okay, children are enjoying a prolonged remission, we normally withdraw the drug and give a drug holiday for a while. If a relapse happens, we restart it again. Methotrexate has got good use in difficult to control Crohn's disease given as weekly subcutaneous injections. Main problem with it is nausea for which you have to give ondansetron before. You also should give folate supplementation. Hepatic and pulmonary fibrosis, which is shown in the textbook in practice, is a little rare, but methotrexate is a good medicine for Crohn's disease. But what has come to actually occupy our lives in the main is biological therapy. In every aspect of uh, uh, pediatrics and every subspecialty practice, some humanized or a human monoclonal antibody has come to stay, especially in rheumatology, hematology, etc. And uh, we know that TNF alpha is the road molecule here, but there are so many other cytokines. So there's so many different antibodies also, which have been used in management of Crohn's disease. Biologics is a, a summary of different trials. Important to say that we have two main biologics being used in IBD. One is infliximab, which is an uh, anti-TNF antibody, which is a 95% human, 5% mouse. And adalimumab, which is totally human anti-TNF antibody. Infliximab is given IV, while adalimumab is given subcutaneously. Because infliximab has got a little bit of mouse component in it, there is an increased chance of allergic reaction. It has to be given as an IV infusion, and you can have adverse reactions to infliximab. And you can also produce antibodies to infliximab fairly easily because part of it is not human. While in adalimumab, map, the chances can happen, but still much lesser. In my personal practice, I tend to prefer adalimumab map because it's easy. Even a subcutaneous injection, parents can be trained to give it, and they don't need to come to hospital and waste a school day coming to hospital for these medications. And now we have others also. Vedalizumab is actually undergoing trials in different parts, and it's actually an anti-integrin antibody, also known to be very useful. There are actually a couple of more antibodies, but that possibly is not very important for our discussion today. So when should you use biologics? So I have put two triangles here. One is called the bottom-up approach, another is a top-down approach. A top-down approach where you get top-heavy and you want to hit the disease hard and send them into deep remission, and that you basically think will cause prolonged remission for a long period of time. If we have particularly difficult disease at presentation, like a severe penetrating or structuring Crohn's disease, severe growth failure, 
and failed induction to conventional treatment. You do not know, you're hitting head against the wall. Extra intestinal manifestations like pyeloma, ganglionism is actually sort of uh, um, swallowing most of the skin. Our steroid refractory ulcerative colitis, you can use biologic treatment. So biologic treatment, you can use as a step up after you've done everything, or if you think it's a particularly bad disease, start top heavy and hit it hard. Other agents, there are a lot of fancy agents as well. I did a Cochrane review on the use of thalidomide, thalidomide drug, which caused a lot of birth defects. Some people in, uh, in Europe tend to use thalidomide. It's a dangerous drug to use, and I think we should not use it. So nutrition and psychosocial, important to remember. 10 years is the median age of presentation. 10 will become 12, 14, 16. Difficult time, teenagers, adolescents, comparison, school, facial hair, lots of difficult things. And they tend to have anxiety, depression. Sometimes they actually can become antisocial. Sometimes low self-esteem, refusing food, refusing feed, refusing medicine. So psyche is also very important in the management of inflammatory bowel disease. And uh, nutritional support, supportive parenting, all have a very important role. Important thing, children with inflammatory bowel disease with their low nutrition plus being on steroids, they may have low vitamin D level, low calcium level, and they may have a low bone health. The DEXA scans for 70% of children in a study done from Kerala um, basically showed that their bone mineral density was minus two standard deviations below the mean for their peer age group. Okay, and last one, coming very close to the end is surgery for Crohn's disease. For ulcerative colitis, we said with the H colectomy is curative. For Crohn's disease, it is not. So for Crohn's disease, try to be as conservative as possible because you need the gut for a lifetime. Surgery has got complications. And one thing I like is surgery begets surgery. Once you open the belly, put a knife, possibly you'll be doing that fairly soon later. And want to be minimalistic, avoid huge resections because once you chop off more and more of the gut, you may end up with a real case of short bowel syndrome. And the last thing is when we're draining perianal abscesses, the surgeons also are going to be very careful not to disturb the sphincter mechanism. The intersphincteric abscesses are particularly difficult. They actually drain the abscess and leave a little set or a thread through which the pus leaks out later. Surgery for Crohn's disease may involve a right hemicolectomy, especially in that particular second case I showed. Child who was actually going off the centires had a stricturing ileocecal area. That was removed. A right hemicolectomy is a superb operation. A right hemicolectomy maintains continence. A right hemicolectomy gets rid of the disease segment as nicely as possible. The ileum is joined to the colon and their outcome is superb. And they have a catch-up growth like magic after it happens. If you have a stricture, you can do a structuroplasty. And if you have abscesses, you drain it with a setin and not to disturb the sphincteric mechanism. Colorectal surgeons are now doing a superb job in our center as well as in other centers managing this children with inflammatory bowel disease. Coming to very early onset IBD, one slide, 50 different mutations. Lots and lots of them are there. We are going to learn more about it in the time to come. There's an overlap with immunology and gastroenterology. A lot of them may actually present like this, severe perianal disease and colitis, like the IL-10 signaling defect. The CMV and EBV-induced HLH, like yesterday's talk we had, huh? XIAP is a particular gene. One particular case I've also dealt with is an IPEX syndrome which is an immune dysregulation, polyendocrinopathy, and colitis. Child had uncontrollable infantile diabetes. Along with that, he had colitis, and he was diagnosed with a Fox P3 gene mutation with an IPEX syndrome. There are so many genes, and majority of them may actually need a bone marrow transplant. And uh, lastly, I have two slides on COVID and the GIT. This was basically because we are in the COVID season. It has got nothing to do with inflammatory bowel disease, but I thought it basically will bring some interest because we are enjoying all these academics because of COVID. Now, COVID and GIT. This is a study from Nebraska published in the Journal of Clinical Virology, and they had children with COVID. And what they have found is vomiting, diarrhea, and mild transaminitis, and some cases of mild pancreatitis were also seen. The liver and pancreas seem to be affected by a cytokine strong. And they also had slightly large gallbladders as well. What they basically said is this ACE2 inhibitor receptors are found in the GIT also, just like in the respiratory tract. And they basically came out with a possibility that there's a concern for fecal-oral transmission because of GI. So washing hands is very, very important here. And we may learn more about this disease in the time to come. One more thing about the adults and uh, COVID was a study from Boston, which Dr. Baskar had actually suggested to me to present. One third of the scanned ICU admitted patients had bowel ischemia. 
and they also had nematosis in the bowel wall and portal vein gas. So they had an enterocolitis, somehow gas producing organisms along the um, vascular radicals have entered the liver also. And small clots were present in the blood vessels on pathological examination. Maybe this was a manifestation of disseminated intravascular clotting or coagulopathy. Also, they had a lot of gallbladder distension in cholecystitis. This gallbladder distension we are seeing in a lot of viral conditions, including hepatitis A. So it's a viral related condition. And basically we may learn more about the GIT and COVID also in the time to come. Now that brings me to the end of my presentation. I've been particularly a little quicker towards the end of the presentation, keeping in with the stipulated time. I enjoyed talking to you and hope you did the same. I'm ready for questions now. Yeah, hello, thank, thank you, Dr. Ramesh. It was an excellent presentation and it was quite crystal clear people i think it is very very well attended session and uh, everybody liked the session a lot we are getting a lot of comments from the uh, participants and they are all happy about the lecture and they are very they think there are some few questions also on that so first oh. thing is uh, to summarize as as you have mentioned it's a chronic relapsing lifetime disease which means with mean age of less than 10 years and seen as early as one year also. So we have to be very careful about this and we have to be picking up as early as possible. And second thing is it's a genetic immune response, environmental influence and gut microbiota has a lot of influence on this, especially with the high fat and high sugar diet. So Correcting the diet as well as the sugar is also another important factor which we have to introduce into our lifestyle and educate the children and the parents to have a diet which is of less sugar as well as less fat. So that, that is going to help out in other aspects as well. Especially in the diagnosis, you have made it very clear about the clinical diagnosis just with taking a proper history and asking about the stool and having blood in the stool as well then fecal examination, then fecal calpoprotein, which is an important diagnostic feature, which is to be done and to reach to the diagnosis. And then comes the endoscopy and iliocolonoscopies, then MR enterography and barium meal, which is a gold standard for all this. So other treatment as well as the treatment is concerned, we have got steroids where we need to give steroids for a longer period of time. A good sign is for the ulcerative colitis where ultimate treatment is surgery. But again, treatment with the surgery is not very much appreciated and they may have other associated complications and problems also. So might as well go with the medical management where as long as we can try to help out the child in gaining weight and not having any problem with the pain abdomen and bloody stools and all. So probiotics, mild to moderate, moderate we can definitely treat it with the probiotics. But one small question which, we ha which I have for you is because yeah. here we are going to give steroids and it's a long-term treatment. Does this have any effect on the bones? Because yes. osteoporosis and all will be there with the osteoporosis and how to take care of the osteoporosis from the beginning only so that the child should not have a problem at the later age. Yes. Okay. What is now the, you want me, uh, should I answer now? Yeah, you can. The, the important thing is steroids. We are always saying to use steroids for the shortest possible duration of time. We normally have a turnaround period of 10 weeks. We want to start and end the steroid within the 10 week, including tapering most of the times. Yes. And uh, during the course of steroid, majority of gastroenterologists also prescribe vitamin D and calcium during that time. Yeah. So that trying, to keep, uh, trying to keep the steroids to the minimum, trying to avoid steroids long term, using steroid sparing agents are all kind of ways and means to try and reduce exposure to steroids. Do, do we need also to go with the DEXA and check up how the bones are there? Most of the treatment protocols currently include DEXA. The problem is having normative norms for normal children that scores of tier group for a particular ethnicity and population. That seems to be a little shortcoming now, but the study from Kerala clearly proves that we have normative data here for our children also, and we can use DEXA scans meaningfully in this age group. Yes. We have some more questions from Dr. Surinder. He wanted yes. to know the cost of the treatment. Okay. Hello? Yeah, yeah. The Dr. Surinder Nath, he wants to know the cost of the treatment. Yes. Uh, the cost of which one, sir? The um, uh, uh, antibody management. Yeah. 
antibody therapy so if yeah. we want to put someone on adalimumab which is the humanized monoclonal antibody 40 mg dose will basically cost them around 28000 rupees that is first dose most of the smaller children they can get only 20 mg that will be every two weekly that will be 12000 rupees it is definitely costly by our standards for some families affordability is a problem but uh, yeah. um, if we can use cheaper alternatives like methotrexate azathioprine is not costly at all and uh, basically sort of if they can manage enteral nutrition that also not expensive so we can tailor it according to it but uh, but obviously the disease will actually take precedence depending on how it is yeah we have another question from dr sharad chronic yes. diarrhea and failure to thrive with no blood in the stool do we still consider it as a ibd no first of all chronic diarrhea with no blood in the stool first we should look at malabsorptive causes our number one cause will be celiac disease any food uh, allergy which the child may have there could be other conditions which could just be a persistent diarrhea because of a other associated infection like a urinary tract infection otherwise um, we should consider other things like tuberculosis and first we should eliminate the intestinal lymph angiectasia a beta lipoproteinemia these things will all be first on the list but anyway endoscopy and biopsy will help in all these conditions also so that we can clarify and think what it is um, this way or that way yeah we have dr rangaya he is raising his hands i i, I request dr rangaya to uh, ask a question sir my advice sir yeah dr rangaya uh, and, uh, and uh, regarding diagnostic yes sir you told that uh, either tuberculosis or any uh, different diagnostic biopsies must or colonoscopy or uh, endoscopy or capsular endoscopy is enough Uh, basically, sir, nothing will become a must. But the only thing is, all of them will aid us in a diagnosis. And none of them is exclusive. All of them are complementary to each other. Yeah, please tell me. Regarding treatment, uh, supportive treatment, because they have recurrent uh, blood in st uh, stools. Uh, any supplementary of iron is necessary. And at the same time, generally, gastroenterologists will prescribe ORS, oral. Uh, that, uh, yes, sir. So ORS is not a pro ORS is not a problem at all, sir. ORS definitely useful for repleting fluids, repleting electrolytes. No problem. About iron in acute phase, we don't use iron. Iron basically in Crohn's disease, we do put them on oral iron. But what happens? Sometimes they malabsorb, and many patients with Crohn's disease do not absorb iron properly. IV iron is also used in patients with Crohn's disease to bring their iron stores appropriately. So oral iron we definitely try. if not even iv iron we give in crohn's disease these days iv iron is very very safe and we have not seen any allergic reaction with a more uh, sort of modern kind of iv iron and secondly some people some special people the especially punjabis are more prone for the this uh, uh, idp is it correct no punjabis. sir uh, what i think is they, they have got a higher incidence of celiac disease celiac disease they have because they are wheat eating population ibd i don't think they are particularly more prone from any of the indian studies ibd is scattered all over india and i think it's a trend which is catching over our whole country it is increasing but i wouldn't say it's an explosion it definitely because we are getting more and more westernized possibly this disease also becoming more and also we are diagnosing them early because we now have more of an insight into it but i do not think punjab as such has got a higher incidence of ibd compared to the rest of the country treatment should be continued uh, continuously or at any time you can give gap if there is no symptoms uh, depending on how long sometimes what you have said is true sometimes you can have a very prolonged remission after you have initially started so that is actually good and it's like a prolonged honeymoon and we want to maintain it like that yeah we have another question sir any role of fecal transplant yes is it fecal micro yeah Yeah, fecal yeah. microbial microbial transplant has been yeah. used for ulcerative colitis, mild to moderate ulcerative colitis, or difficult to control ulcerative colitis, not severe or not toxic megacolon, and it has found very good results. Fecal microbial transplant will come to stay as one of the very important home remedies for ulcerative colitis in the time to come. There are some people in the US who basically are storing a mixer grinder in the garage. and they are actually buying the super poo and they are doing a fecal microbial transplant themselves by giving themselves an enema but this basically in an academic kind of environment it has to be done in a hospital but more and more people are doing fecal microbial transplant but the important thing is this one is not a very glamorous kind of procedure it still has to catch up yes. and we still need to get more information on it 
Correct. We have got Dr. V R N Reddy who is raising hand. May I request V R N to ask hello, a question? Hello, hello. How are you? I'm Thank fine, you sir. Please tell I'm me. I came to Warangal, sir. Thank I'm you so much for coming. Nice to see you. And yes. uh, Dr. Ramesh Srinivasan, very nice and elaborate lecture. Thank you, sir. Only after hearing the repetitive lecture, I am uh -huh. reminding to tell only three points: uh -huh. importance of history and uh -huh. physical examination. Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I agree with you. Even even yesterday, yes, the importance of history. It will tell you about the story of the disease process. Absolutely, and it is always uh, is a constant. It will not vary. Whereas it runs over a period of time, so you have to take listen properly and take the repeated history. Then. Absolutely. After going through the thorough physical examination, the physical examination will reveal you reveal you about the condition of the patient, and it is it is always constant. It varies from time to time. It is not constant like history. It varies from time to time. and that condition of the patient depends upon the point of time so that is the reason why all the speakers yesterday before yesterday stressing that you should examine a sick patients as many times as possible because yes yes yesterday that was very important take away from ah, dr sridhar kalyani stop that got repeated time, examination ah repeated and it tells about the condition of the patient where right. history again you have to listen properly because it is a we may miss patient is always right doctor is not right patient is always right whatever he says he should accept listen it properly if you not able to understand again listen and listen so with these points i want to nice lecture we are again uh, recurring our pg uh, period how to teach and how to learn i'm very happy no no doc, doc, dr reddy thank you so much sir. thank you so much Dr Reddy you very rightly pointed out clinical history and spending time with the patient is the gold standard suppose yes. we as clinicians many of the diagnosis can be done on clinical history and proper examination of the patient investigations is to confirm it investigations yes, yes. should not be me, taken as a priority yes, yes. i just said i just said according to me and history we can diagnose almost about, about, uh, about 60 yes. to 70% yes. And the examination say twenty to thirty percent. Investigation or only ten percent will help you. Yes, yes, very true. It is just to confirm. Seventy percent we can diagnose the diseases. Correct. So we we have got one more question, Doctor Ramesh. I think this will be the last question. Uh, so, okay. Want to thank, you. thank you. Dietary we advice for IBD. Yes, I can't hear you properly. Dietary advice for IBD. Ah. The in fact um, the. Uh, dietary advice for ibd there are lots mm. of recommendations from lot of bodies so what happens is because we said diet is very important some people even try a dairy free diet and a gluten free diet how it helps we do not know different kinds of probiotic concoctions are also used but the bottom line is there is no clearly defined diet which will help with ibd but important lesson what we have to take from exclusive enteral nutrition is we are inducing remission by using a milk formula by reducing the number of antigens by reducing the complexity of antigens by not giving the immune system so much to react to so a more bland less antigen prone diet is particularly going to be useful what i tell my ibd patients is to take low spice and not to take very hot food and uh, yes. what we basically sort of uh, uh, mean is we want to reduce the antigenic complexity to the intestine and this basically we have to take this caveat from exclusive ventral nutrition by reducing the antigenicity you will also reduce what is happening inside the intestine but there are a lot of studies on gluten free diet and casein free diet in inflammatory bowel disease but none of them show a consistent response and if you say probiotics only proof is there for that e coli one for the uh, nissel uh, and also for the vsl3 for ulcerative colitis only for crohn's even probiotics are not particularly useful it's, it's more of a individualized uh, for a particular patient it can be yeah. very patient to patient also yes absolutely yeah so uh, thank you very much dr srinivas it was an excellent presentation and being with you was a great uh, honor for me also and uh, we really had a excellent time and excellent presentation thank you so much and any anything else to be added dr sri krishna
Yeah, a couple of questions which came from YouTube feed and also here. Um, yes. Dr. Ramesh, uh, any role of probiotics specifically? Uh, probiotics only for ulcerative colitis, none for Crohn's, which I've just answered in the last question. And that's okay. only for mild to moderate UC. Nothing, nothing for Crohn's probiotics. Okay. Uh, relation between food allergy and IBD? Uh, relationship between food allergy and IBD that I think will make it a huge mishmash. There is no clear-cut proof. Food allergies like um, uh, proctocolitis uh, uh, and allergic enterocolitis are totally different issues. We also have eosinophilic gastro uh, intestinal disease, which is also totally different. So they are all different diseases. Basically, better not to mix them up together. Yeah, uh, I'll be launching the poll. Request to all the members to uh, please. Uh, vote before you leave. It will help us understand whether uh, the session's been useful for all of us or not. Uh, Dr. Ramesh, may I use this one minute to ask you a query which most of us face in our OPs. We find many children with abdominal pain on ultrasound, mm -hmm. non-specific mesenteric lymphadenitis. Is there yes. anything new in terms of management? Uh, what do you suggest as, let's say, ABCDE of the management of these children who really come with this is real discomfort that they go through and we can't yeah. just keep them on spasmodics for a long time. What do you suggest? See, I have a natural history in my mind as to this mesenteric adenitis thing. Mesenteric adenitis mostly follows a viral infection one or two weeks after the viral infection. Parents may or may not remember that that happened. And this mesenteric adenitis basically majority of times will last for three to four weeks. So it is not going to go away in a few days if someone wants magic. And this is an important counseling point. And the third thing is majority of them are associated with constipation. This is also very important. In my management of mesenteric adenitis, once they basically, what we do with abdominal pain, we don't want to miss anything. They come with an ultrasound. We always check amylase lipase so that we don't miss pancreatitis. We check LFT so that we are not missing a hepatitis. CBP, CRP, they come with so it says it's not an infection. Done. So, and the urine, if the urine is clear, we are okay. So only mesenteric adenitis, I tell them it takes three to four weeks to get better. Don't expect magic. And I prescribe laxatives twice a day so that he goes to motions regularly. Then we basically, for mesenteric adenitis pain, paracetamol is also useful. If at all they're getting spasms, making them cry, then you can use an antispasmodic if needed. The most important thing here is to counsel the parents that it will take time to go. Otherwise, they will jump from pillar to post and go and meet so many different people, making a mess of the whole thing. And uh, most of the times, once they spend that amount of time, they remember, doctor said it's going to take such a long time. So by usually around a month, they turn around the corner. And when I stress the importance of going to motion, it's also important that they actually make this child sit, take the medicines. And majority of times, it works for me. And this is my magic formula. But I don't think this is written in any textbook. So, Thank I'll you so much, sir. So, so what we say is, it's going to take time. It's going to take time. Please hold on. And often it happens that the last doctor whom they show up, Probably gives the same medicine or let's say even a probiotic and then it gets better. So ultimately, counseling counseling is most important and we need to spend time in counseling to the patient. Yeah, uh, Dr. Ramesh, just an extension of this. Is this because of uh, more availability of uh, junk food and also the lifestyle which the current children lead? Has it actually seen an increase nowadays, mesenteric lymphadenitis? Uh, mesenteric lymphadenitis is being more and more diagnosed because of ultrasound, because ultrasound is more available. That's what I think. And uh, moreover, in mesenteric adenitis, the radiologists normally give you a, um, a size of the mesenteric nodes. Once it exceeds one mm, one centimeter, which is 10 mm, they're all worried. Important thing is if vascularity is good and if it's showing a reactive nature and there is no necrosis in these nodes, we are very happy. Even in the ileocecal area, even normally mesenteric nodes are going to be there. Now, I am not particularly sure or I have actually not found a particular relevance to the kind of food and what is happening. But the good old theory that it's a post-infectious thing, it happens a little bit of time after it is actually very, very important. Now, um, if we follow this mesenteric adenitis children, some of them have got little functional element also. And they are these worried well parents who actually carry them along wherever they go and show them to one person or the other. I think that is also there. And families are also now more smaller and parents are also more and extremely careful, even if they're well. Yeah, an extension of this question from Dr. Sridhar. Yeah. Uh, management of recurrent mesenteric lymphadenitis. Yeah. Uh, See, you find it happening often it, enough? It happens. See, the mesenteric nodes are there basically where the mesentery is. And whenever we have an upper respiratory infection, the neck glands swell up. Similarly, the abdominal glands can also swell up because they say in a viral infection, there is a 
primary viremia where it spreads all over the body then you basically have the secondary viral kind of pattern coming so this mesenteric lymphadenitis can also be recurrent the only thing is what i say if the nodes are becoming more than around 15 mm showing some necrosis so oddities are there about it yes we worry about them but like, see sometimes i have seen some children started on anti tuberculous treatment based on this ultrasound which is also totally totally not correct but what i would say recurrent lymphadenitis can also happen lymph nodes which are swollen up with this viral infection they can also swell up with another viral infection also but if the general examination is good growth parameters are good and the interval period the child is totally well then we may actually want to find faith in that recurrent mesenteric lymphadenitis theory yeah uh, another, another last, question from, last question from last uh, question from uh, dr bhaskar which one is better from the viewpoint of the outcomes and also the difficult Pelvic and suffering of the child. Is it Crohn's or ulcerative colitis? See, if someone asks me to choose a disease, I will choose ulcerative colitis because ulcerative colitis is a kind of little bit easy. And if actually I need a cure, if I get my colectomy done, I have a cure for the disease. And if I actually can bear a lifelong ileostomy stoma, I don't need to worry about the little cuff of rectum which will be left in case I want a pouch later. But Crohn's disease is a malady; it will haunt you for a lifetime and will eat you bit by bit from the inside. Right. So thank you. The last question. for the day uh, any role of uh, i would say two questions role of uh, three of them quickly tell me yes no vitamin d in idb hmm uh, i believe so, uh, a lot of a lot of papers no clear proof zinc yeah. zinc not really iron as a treatment especially in crohn's because they are then I, yeah then and uh, the last one in this series antibiotics in mesenteric adenitis the one which we just discussed uh see antibiotics is a controversial kind of topic unless there are clear cut signs of infection from the history examination or from the testing then there is no real need for that because mostly the mesenteric adenitis is a post infectious thing the infection is gone now the residual is what is there and we are basically treating that so the answer should be from an ethical point of view or from a, a, a academic point of view no unless you have actually proven that there is an infection great that that's that's the ideal way to do it the last question of the day uh, let, let me read it out as the comment came up uh, from shruti uh, she yeah. says it's a wonderful lecture sir is the class classification of ibd based on the age of presentation as pediatric early onset infantile is it still followed or is it just uh, uh, V now, or it's only V E O type. Now, what has happened is there are a lot of nitty gritty in the IBD presenting in children. Now, what is happening is this very early onset IBD is for children less than the age of six years. There is also an infantile inflammatory bowel disease and a neonatal onset inflammatory bowel disease also. And if children less than the age of two present with this condition, very early onset IBD, one more V is added to it. Now, the issue is. you can go dissecting it out so many times but i think sometimes we need to have some simple classifications for life and veo ibd has come to stay as the word for ibd in children less than the age of 6 all of them don't need to have monogenic disorders or severe disease they may have a clear cut crohn's or an ib ulcerative colitis presentation for example i have seen ulcerative colitis in 2 years old which are very very clear with all the different kind of definitions but the only thing is they are making this apparent classification of very early onset ibd so that we think immunologically we think about other conditions we think about genetic conditions which may have a treatment apart from what we do like a bone marrow transplant where we may not actually treat them with a conventional treatment so it is something for us to bear in mind but it does not take away our thinking cap thank you so much dr ramesh you know we will be happy to share any questions that come up later as well with you for uh, any questions let me, me share the uh, results uh, yeah. uh, yeah just a minute sir these are the reasons so we saw people answering all the options at the end of the session we know that everyone's chosen the correct answer sir is this the correct answer ah that's pediatric ulcerative colitis activity index yeah all right so that's <laughs> again no objective evidence of how good your talk was that oh, that's all from my end uh, dr c n reddy one yeah. quick word of sir. thanks to me to everyone my my special thanks to dr c n reddy dr baskar dr um, uh, uh, rsp sri krishna that is you who have done a fabulous job and my special thanks to dr nawni halsing for the very kind introduction and pleasant words when he basically started off this uh, particular talk thank you so much i enjoyed being here
Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. C. N. Reddy. Please closing remarks. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Thank sir. you, Dr. Ramesh Srinivasan, for a extraordinary and excellent lecture. Actually, we really enjoyed your lecture. Thank you and so much. And also, it was very much informative. And like a students, we were immersed in your lecture. Actually, <laughs> and uh, this all these days. we are enjoying we became students uh, we are learning the things seniors are refreshing the uh, knowledge in pediatrics and juniors and post graduates they are learning a lot and thank you very much and i also thank moderator dr nonihal singh he made it very lively uh, li lively and uh, very interactive session and i also thank total webinar coordinator dr R S V Krishna, Sri Krishna, uh, for throughout the session, he was very alert and uh, may, made it a very successful webinar. And uh, coming days also, we have a nice lectures, and uh, we can learn lot of things. Uh, thank you all the participants and our E B members, and secretary and treasurer and all the E B members. Thank you one and all. Thank Dr. you, sir. Bhaskar, you are closing. comments please and uh, i have a comment from dr suren nath asking uh, or hoping that academics will go on post lockdown you want to respond to that yeah yeah thank you dr suren nath uh, yeah we have our plans to continue this uh, webinar sessions even after the lockdown and probably fortnightly or so thanks for your suggestion and uh, more than 110 participants were there listening attentively to our speaker dr ramesh sinwasan and really you made this ibd a huge complex topic so simple so informative we had enjoyed by learning it that is the speciality of a speaker like dr ramesh sinawasan and in nutshell i say iip tc is enriched with your presence you, particularly in academics and uh, i feel the sick children suffering from uh, pediatric gastroenterology cases are lucky to have Dr. Srinivas Ramesh in Hyderabad, catering to the entire Telangana, Andhra, and neighboring states. We are very proud of you. Thank you, thank you for your for your precious time, and uh, I thank the moderator, Dr. Navneet Singh, for uh, moderating so well. You are one of the few best moderators uh, which we have seen uh, during these webinars. Thank you, Dr. Navneet Singh. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My special thanks always go to Dr. Sri Krishna, who who makes me very cool in this sectary world. very nice i know very little thank you dr sri krishna i thank all the participants and tomorrow we have another interesting session uh, that is on ckd chronic kidney disease by another icon by another icon uh, dr mehul shah so thank you one and all safe stay good night and my colleague dr sridhar will be saying few words before we close the session thank you one and all Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Ramesh Srinivasan, sir. It's a nice lecture. It's Thank a volatile you. subject, sir. You made it as uh, very easy for the both alcide bolts and crons. And uh, now we can plan for the things. And uh, thanks for the moderator, Navneet Singh, sir, who had uh, made very easy for the IAPNs uh, with the uh, coordination and other things. And thanks, special thanks to R S Singh who made the webinars possible. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, one and all, sir. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Make sure you press on leave meeting. The app will run in the background if you don't uh, exit uh, without uh, pressing on end or leave meeting. And uh, tomorrow, uh, see you all again tomorrow at 8 p.m. And uh, please make sure you share your feedback in case you haven't. Uh, uh, your feedback will help us and plan things better. We progress to a stage where we have a small quiz in the beginning and also at the end we have a feedback form and we are able to start every day at 8 o'clock sharp. And then it's been an excellent interaction. Thanks everyone good night thank you